This is John Quelch, the Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School, and welcome to this uh, Knight Foundation Venture uh, Leaders Fireside Chat with uh, John Oranger, the Executive Chairman of uh, Shutterstock. And uh, with me this evening uh, uh, to help uh, uh, the discussion is uh, Michael Wilson, our Senior Lecturer of Entrepreneurship uh, in the Management Department here at uh, Miami Herbert Business School. Uh, warm welcome, John. Thanks so much for uh, sharing uh, uh, your story and your time with us. Uh, I want to start, if I may, just with a very simple question of uh, what, what, what is Shutterstock and uh, how did it originate and uh, where did the name come from? Sure. Uh, Shutterstock, I, I started Shutterstock in 2003. It was a side project, actually. It was a side project uh, to help uh, 10 other companies that I had previously started that all needed imagery. It was 2003 and it was pretty hard to get uh, commercially licensed imagery for the web. Uh, and I started shooting images myself. I put them on this kind of side project website. I called it Shutterstock at the time. It was a name that was available and kind of uh, evoked uh, uh, the, the, the feeling that I, I wanted to have for the product. Um, which was a subscription product all you can download the images were royalty free you pay for them once you can use them anywhere in the world um uh yeah and and what happened was that uh side project became bigger than the other 10 companies closed down the other 10 focused on shutterstock and here we are 18 years later the four billion dollar public company I think I read that you had uh, taken a hundred thousand photographs in one year to uh, build the uh, the bank, but you were kind enough to the public to edit them down to thirty thousand before you went uh, commercial, right? Yeah, I, uh, I bought a camera. I knew I needed to start the marketplace somehow. I had the chicken and egg kind of issue that all marketplaces have. You need uh, the buyers and the sellers. Uh, you need the uh, the product before the buyers come in and buyers aren't coming until you have the product. So decided I could probably figure it out. So I went around with a camera, got people to sign model releases, got property releases, got commercially released images on a website and started selling the first subscription stock photography product. How did, how did you uh, come up with the notion of doing it on a subscription basis? Because I think previously, uh, stock photography had been sold on a kind of per item basis right uh, but you 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 completely threw out that model yeah it was um it was early on it was my own experience i was i was um iterating on a lot of different uh marketing kind of mechanisms to sell my other products which were software products so i needed imagery of that would convey feelings or that would um, describe certain situations, um, and they were often generic photos that um, you know people can use to describe other situations as well. Um, they could be as simple as you know uh, early e-commerce, like someone looking at their credit card and typing in the, the number on a keyboard. Um, really simple images that didn't exist yet, um, and I needed a lot of them. And so uh, it was early on in the internet. The advertising models were were pretty new. Um, and a subscription just made sense. It was, I needed several images a day. I didn't want to negotiate price for each one. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't want to have to call somebody up. Uh, and so that's what I did. I made it, at the time it was like 40 or $50 a month for any one of my images, which um, they weren't that great, honestly, but they did the job. <laughs> and before I hand over to Michael uh, to continue the, uh, the discussion, um, you know, it's sort of interesting that uh, you, you had these, I think you said, nine other companies that you'd already founded before, before this one. And um, what were those companies about? And how did you know that this company was the one that was better than all of the others? Yeah, they were all software-based companies. Windows was the dominant platform at the time. Uh, the Mac hadn't really... Uh, Apple hadn't really made its way into um, personal computing the way they have today. Um, so I focused on the Windows platform. This was, you know, late 90s. I was still in, in school. Um, I started creating uh, uh, software products that I would have liked myself, personal firewalls that prevented people from hacking into your computer. Um, 
cookie managers to make sure that um, uh, you you were you were aware of who was tracking you and where they were tracking you, what they were doing with your information. Um, a lot of these themes, it's funny, uh, still exist today, um, and it's become kind of a chicken and mouse, uh, cat and mouse kind of kind of game for those um, uh, businesses to continue to evolve and kind of uh, uh, do that. But at, at the time, my image business was was way ahead of all the software businesses. So I decided to focus on uh, on the image business at that time. Got it. Michael? Yeah, sure, John. Uh, thanks for being with us. Um, we kind of want to go back in time. I mean, you're a college college student, like many of the uh, the viewers tonight. And so you're on the clueless side. I mean, were you programming in in Fortran and Quick Basic? And, <laughs> you know, how did you... How did you, you know, begin to iterate and tack and, and know that you could hire your first employee? Yeah, so it was the late 90s. It was around 96, 97 when, um, when I started to create these products. Uh, I used uh, Microsoft Visual Studio. Uh, so I used C Sharp and Visual Basic um, at the time. Uh, in your dorm room? Yeah. Is this where you are? Okay. That's, that's where I was in the dorm room. Um, and then on the web side to create the web applications for the e-commerce pieces, which those things didn't exist either. Right. Um, there were some gateways like authorized.net and some others that would allow you to kind of figure out how to pass a credit card through and get a bank to clear it. Um, I used Perl for all of those web services. All right. um, so between all of those tools, I was able to develop software and sell them online. I pretty much had to develop all of those services myself because they did not exist at the time. Okay, and then, uh, so you're getting some traction. Um, 1999 rolls around and there's a, there's a crash, like the bubble, like, like nobody wants to hear anything with the web in it. So what are you doing? How are you, how are you eating ramen noodles? How are you paying your bills? Yeah, at the time, uh, this product called Surf Secret was a, it was a privacy and security suite. Um, the internet did crash, but I was able to continue to sell that, that product. Um, I was a, kind of a one man show with a bunch of consultants, um, contractors uh, that would help me um, fix bugs and um, improve the product and you know work on the next release and stuff like that. So I was selling hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of the software in my dorm room, honestly. Wow. And, and you know, most computer scientists, they're a little bit bashful, a little bit, you know, they're nocturnal. Like did selling come easy to you? It was just a, a force of like, you needed the, the, the you know, the cash flow, did you have to practice or, you know, who was inspiring you to, to, to build this, right? You know, it was, it was mostly experimentation. I mean, there were, there were, there were search engines like, you know, Google was just coming um, online. Yahoo was around um, and there were definitely businesses that were, that were forming and, and selling things. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, companies that went public without revenue that got the crazy valuations that then fell really quickly. Um, that was a different strategy. I didn't follow that strategy. Um, uh, even though at the, at the time it seemed crazy that I was not uh, until it did crash, but um, pet I, remember pets.com. Pets com. Yeah. Pets.com. Um, turns out it was a great strategy, just wrong timing. Right. Um, yeah, it was, it was slow and steady and iterative. Um, I would, build the product feature by feature. Um, it was a subscription, right? So it was a, you would, you would buy this, this like 20 digit key that you would put into the software product and the software product would work for one year. And then after the end of the year, you would need to go buy another code and stick it in. Um, it was the, it was early kind of shareware um, software. And so it became addictive. Like as I would get more sales, I would try to figure out how to get even more sales. I kept coming back to that, um, needing imagery to sell the thing. And that's why I can, I was continuously haunted by this idea of a subscription stock photo product. Haunted, like, like, uh, obsessed or haunted, like spooked. It was, it was a problem I had. I knew, I mean, there were other entrepreneurs on the, on the internet. I, I, I knew of also that had the same problem. People were basically stealing imagery. They would go on to whatever website they can find, take images, I knew they were getting cease and desist notices. I knew it wasn't a, um, a, a sustainable strategy for a business. Um, and it seemed like these were funded businesses that were going to get bigger and bigger. 
So um, when I started to get traction myself with really bad images that I took, I knew the bar was really low and I had to jump on it. But what about some other challenges? You know, like, like the University of Miami Herbert Business School student is trained in accounting and some strategy and finance. So they're, they're good with presentations and numbers. You're a computer scientist, you know, you're coding. How did you handle the business, you know, the language of, of business, right? You're, you're faking this until, until you, you know, you, you leave the dorm room. Like what was going on in your head? It was, uh, it, it was little by little. I, um, I was, I mean, I could pass a, I, I could accept a credit card through a secure form. I could pass it through a gateway. I can get a bank to clear it. I could get money, you know, ACH to my, my bank account. That was the first challenge. And so once I was able to solve that, then it was about hiring people to usually on a contract basis, accountants and lawyers to make sure I was doing everything the right way. Sure. Um, of course I made mistakes early on and everybody did. It was very wild west. Um, but we, you know, we figured it out and the internet adapted with us. How long in before you, you raised your first round of, of capital, you know, beyond, you know, family, friends, fools, like, like series a. So Shutterstock was bootstrapped. I didn't raise anything, uh, until I did a secondary in 2007. So okay. four or five years later, Wow. At like a $250 million valuation. Um, and then the first money hit the balance sheet from the outside was the IPO. So it was, it's a truly bootstrapped wow. story. Wow. Literally jump street to, to Wall Street. Yeah. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about the, the, the progressions, right? Like, like the first, say, dozen employees, and then maybe when it changed and now you have 100 employees. That, that's, a, that's a different, you know, there's different mechanisms, different, different aspect. How are you growing, you know? um during this 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 run-up yeah it was it was chaos just like any other company is they look really organized and uh and and, and deliberate uh but but it's very chaotic we hired um we started to build teams we started to build product teams we started to build customer service teams um we expanded internationally really fast because i want i knew that you know images Images were easy to sell with a few words. You didn't have to, you didn't need that much copy to sell an image. And so sure. the first thing we, we did um, when it came to internationalization was translate the site into Japanese. So then I needed Japanese customer support and translators. And so um, everything kept growing uh, from, uh, from there. I mean, I got to about 75 employees uh, before I, I took the investment, the secondary investment uh in, in from insight in 2007 did that, did that come with a board like they're gonna say not you know advisory board they're your friends uh, a board of directors they're your bosses i mean so what was that like for young john oranger i mean you know yeah before that there was no board so right. four years later we 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 create one it turned out to be really useful because they helped me you know build the team we didn't have a cfo we sure. i knew i wanted to take it public but i was still at that point four to five years away from it because it was 2012 when we finally got out. Um, I was also, you know, not so sure how long, I, I knew I was able to, to create um, the thing I created and continue to build the marketplace. But could I manage, you know, I could manage 75 employees, but could I imagine a hundred, could I manage a hundred, 200, right. 500? Right. I, I knew it was going to keep growing. I had no idea where my limit was on that. Sure. Um, I decided to just keep going. What about threats? Were there posers and, you know, some, some, you know, challenges, people uh, nipping at you, you know, Microsoft decides to get in the game, right? Like what, you know, how well, the, you looking over your shoulder while you're driving and it couldn't have been all uh, gum, gumdrops and lollipops, right? I mean, the, the, um, there was a community of stock photographers that did not like what I was doing. Sure. Uh, they thought I was, uh, devaluing photography. Um, they thought it was a threat to them. Um, what I was doing though was democratizing photography. I mean, we went from, I mean, when I started in this, when I started Shutterstock, there were maybe, you know, thousands, maybe 10,000 stock photographers. They mostly shot on film. This was, you know, the 2003 was the first digital SLR under a thousand dollars. I thought that was a turning point. Um, I mean, today Shutterstock has two million 
photographers. Uh, and I think that's just scratching the surface of the planet of people who want to sell their, their images. We created a marketplace that allowed people to sell their, their photography and that marketplace didn't exist before. So I, you know, there were some angry people early on, but whenever things change, there are. Interesting. Really interesting. Um, all right, let's maybe tack a little bit, um, unless the Dean wants to jump in, but, uh, who, 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 who's your inspiration? Is this parental? Is it, you know, a grandfather, you know, we, we're often looking at whether entrepreneurs are made or born. And, you know, here you are telling us this incredible story, you know, we're, who's your inspiration? Where's the fire come from? My parents were both teachers. My dad, uh, taught uh, chemistry, science. So I have a, had a bit of a, uh, there was a lot of influence there from the science and, uh, and engineering side uh, and math. Um, I, was, I was obsessed with stories of, of Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and how they were creating what they were creating. I thought computers were um, these uh, things that gave you superpowers. You, know, you can create this small program. Uh, you can run this program. You can, it, it does things while you sleep. It does really hard work uh, after you give it uh, instructions and it just keeps going. Um, and I was fascinated by that. Um, and so the idea of having this like 24 seven business that kept operating when I was not uh, sitting at a computer was, was, was fascinating to me. Um, so it was a combination of kind of this uh, using using computers to create something really big, um, and also at the time looking at you know just reading amazing stories about uh, people that um, were building these incredible platforms that I wanted to do as well. Uh, really uh, <clears throat> inspiring and fascinating. I'm sure to our to our viewership here, the the students who are um, just starting you know their their ideas and to do feasibility studies. Um, so while you're building the company, you still have a personal life. Where do you go when, when you need to center yourself? Like, I don't know if you were courting anyone. I don't know how you had time with, you know, seven days a week, 20 hour days, you know, where, where were you finding balance? You know, so you've got this beast, you know, brewing and growing and, you know, it's on the uptick. What are you doing personally? Are you taking improv classes? I mean, what? <laughs> It was, uh, I was in my late twenties when I started Shutterstock and, uh, it was, I had, I had so many tries and failures before that, that when I saw this hit, it was the only thing I wanted to do. So I literally for, you know, the next from 2007, I mean, I'm sorry, from 2003 to 2012, there wasn't much else besides Shutterstock I did. Yeah. Uh, That's maybe sleep. Yeah. Common thing. <laughs> Dean, you know, often has, uh, the, the founder of Home Depot was here and he, they were opening up so many stores that he didn't want to take time to go to the bathroom. Like, like he just 24 seven, right. It becomes a part of your blood and, and adrenaline. Um, yep. Would you, would you describe entrepreneurship? I mean, again, it, it just sounds so joyous, um, different from my experiences, pers you know, building companies. Um, what about the loneliness of it? You know, some have described it as unprecedented inert loneliness. Like, you know, when things were really tricky, you had to fire someone or you, you couldn't afford to hire the right CTO and your, you know, the trade-offs, where did you go to center yourself and, and sort of get you through the, you know, a, a tough day? Yeah, it was hard. I mean, the, the thing that you start to realize is that while, while I, I, you need to be all in in order to be successful and Pretty much, I mean, you have lots of employees that care about their job, but it's it's a job for them and it's your life for you. Um, you started this thing, and uh, and it, it could be it could be strange uh, to be in a position where you have lots of people you're paying, but there's a big disconnect um, in yeah. terms of uh, how you feel about this thing versus how the people that work for you feel about this thing, and uh, it's totally natural i mean it's it's how it should be um but it's a strange thing um yeah, yeah, there were your child right your baby your firstborn yeah right it was it was um and still it uh i own i own i'm still the largest shareholder i own a lot less of it today it's a publicly traded company i'm not ceo anymore it's still something i think about several times a day 
I dream about it. I wake up thinking about it. Um, and I go to sleep thinking about it. It's, uh, I think it's going to be like that forever. Was there a point in your life that, that someone came into it and, and got you to uh, maybe decompress, go, you know, out to the apple orchard? Like, like what do you do in your off time? I mean, you're, you're a photographer, so are you taking pictures and contributing as well? I mean, wh wh you know, where do you reset? Yeah, I have, I, I had enough hobbies that I was able to, um, to disconnect sometimes. Uh, friends in the city, uh, I played guitar. I learned how to fly a helicopter, something I always wanted to do. So I took yeah. lessons, started taking lessons in 2000, um, I think it was 2008. Um, yeah, I mean, you could do all of those things, but there's still only one person at the end of the day making the big decisions. And with that, like your philosophy, do you pay yourself first or last and why? I mean, I built, I wanted to build the company to be uh, really big, but I also wanted to be sustainable. Uh, we paid our employees really well. We continue to uh, we pay in equity, we pay in cash. Um, and then at the end, it's, it's, it's what's left over when it's a private company. Um, yeah. You decide, you know, are you going to make some acquisitions? Are you going to pay a dividend? Are you going to um, uh, make some more capital investments uh, in the business? Uh, and, and it's, uh, you know, it, it became a process with the board quarterly. Uh, and, and, um, I always, uh, I always went to growth first, uh, but the company has always been profitable. So, um, there was always a balance, but it, but it was always, uh, uh, first to grow and then, uh, to get, to get the profits out. Well, the, uh, the, the Q and A is, uh, ringing off the hook. One, one final question before we have, uh, the audience participate, they're super excited to, to ask their, their challenges. Um, what was the favorite part of your journey? Um, was it the bootstrap days, jump, you know, um, jump street, or was it, you know, going public? And, and that's a big cataclysmic shit, tectonic shift when you go from private to, to public, um, you know, both all nighter, like what, what, you know, where would you say was um, the best of your days? Like you've stepped back now, is that so that you can get that startup fervor again, you know, like, you know, yeah. Yeah. So my, I mean, hands down, my favorite time is the, is the, is the start. Um, that's why I was able to put 10 irons in the fire in the beginning. Um, and, and now we're trying to do a lot more of that with Pareto, which is, uh, this, this incubator that we're building in Miami now. Um, that's my favorite, but at the same time, I couldn't turn down the next challenge each time it showed, it, it came to me. And that's why for 17 years, I was CEO and for, uh, for seven or eight, I was public company CEO doing quarterly calls. That was not in my personality. I had to figure out how to do that. Um, sure, 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 sure. So I, I, I honestly, that wasn't as fun uh, as, as the early building. And that's why I'm happy I was able to uh, get the best of all worlds here. I'm executive chairman. I have a CEO yep. uh, of Shutterstock, but at the same time, I get to, I, I get to start lots of companies on the side. Right. And we're, uh, we're blessed that you chose Miami, which seems to be, um, you know, lots of people that are, are consciously coming here. And so, you know, the second half of this, hopefully we'll, we'll talk more about um, how we can interact, but uh, I'll turn it to the Dean. And then, and then um, there's, there's all kinds of questions that we're going to start throwing at you. From, yeah. From so, uh, you know, let, let me, uh, you know, thank you, John, for the answers, uh, encourage our audience and uh, especially our students. We have students from uh, Michael's class, but, also from uh, David Major's uh, strategy class and other students. So please uh, send in your questions, Michael's uh, reviewing them as I speak. Um, one, one of the things I'm curious about, uh, John, um, is you know, just the, uh, to go back to a point you made, the sustaining, um, the sustaining of your commitment as CEO for 17 years, that's, a tremendous amount of time. And even though it was your baby, um, that's a long, long uh, time in the, in the hot seat. Uh, how did you manage through that? And when it came to the point where you were finally able to hand over to uh, another CEO, uh, where did that CEO come from? And uh, did, you, did you leave a letter in your uh, desk drawer? <laughs> um, the... 
the transition. So I never knew when it was going to be time to move on, but um, move on from the CEO role. I'm still involved daily in Shutterstock, but the CEO role itself, um, it's hard to know if you're not a career CEO and you're literally an entrepreneur that just keeps building when, uh, when you run out of uh, your skill set. For me, it was around a thousand employees when I couldn't, I couldn't teach myself uh, anymore how to manage. Like I couldn't, I couldn't get myself to the next level. I wasn't interested in, you know, executive coaching. I got, I got a lot of um, uh, uh, kind of referrals to, to, to different types of uh, people that were experts in like getting you from a thousand employees to ten thousand employees, and I kind of needed to, to kind of look deep and and ask myself if that was really something I wanted to commit to. Um, when I got to around 800, 900, 1,000 employees, the, the management structure of the company just really changes. You need, you need autonomous units. You need, you need almost these mini CEOs that are able to handle their own budgets. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and you know, and you know, I, I saw what, what big companies were doing and I just decided I, I needed somebody else to do that. So I started to look. Um, I started to bring people into the company that could be uh, uh, that could succeed me. I started to talk to my board. Um, it was it, it took about three years. Um, today, Stan uh, Pavlovsky is our CEO at Shutterstock. He's doing a great job. Um, I'm glad we did the transition when when we did because again, I get the best of all worlds as executive chairman. I get to be involved with the big strategic moves of this kind of huge company that um, you know that. Um, uh, can do incredible things with, with its strong balance sheet. And I get to uh, mentor and fund uh, uh, new ideas and, and new entrepreneurs uh, and kind of help them go through that, that early stage that I went through. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about Pareto and how, how is that distinct from uh, other uh, venture capital type uh, entities? Yeah, it's it's a really unique uh, structure. So I created it with uh, with with Ed Lando, who's also down in Miami, um, and we we have complementary skill sets. Uh, we both really enjoyed building companies at the early stage, both incubating them and investing in them. Uh, there's no external capital; it's all it's all our own capital. Uh, so it's kind of uh, a cross between an incubator and accelerator. It's a little bit like Y Combinator, but we don't take any outside money. Um, and so it's unique in that way. We together, we have the entire spectrum of the entrepreneurial kind of, uh, uh, path. Uh, and we get to get, get, get to help, uh, lots of entrepreneurs be involved in them in their businesses at an early stage as investors uh, and help them grow. And uh, how many companies uh, does Pareto invest in? Um, is there a, an upper limit? Uh, are there other criteria that determine where you place your bets? We've made uh, probably 150 investments in the past 12 months. Uh, and I think uh, that's going to be the minimum yearly that I think we'll do. Um, these, are, uh, these are early stage businesses um, we're able to kind of pattern match and see uh, whether the entrepreneur and the idea make enough sense for us to make the investment. Um, and yeah, it's uh, I, I think it's I think it's a great strategy. I think a lot of um, a lot of the later stage kind of venture capital firms um, would like to do this. It takes it takes a really unique type of skill set that Ed and I have and and. Uh, structure which we've built and uh, pairing that with Miami, which is an up and coming uh, kind of um, uh, tech scene. Uh, it's it's building fast down there. Um, it's the perfect perfect combo. I mean, but, but basically, uh, there's an experience curve effect here that enables you to. Uh, I think I'm quoting you here: fund and launch a, a new company in one week, right? Yeah, we can we, we can we can definitely do that, and we've we've done that. We've met entrepreneurs, they've brought us their ideas, or we've brought them the list of ideas that they can match with. We've put money in a in an account and 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 gotten them their pre seed round literally in a week from 
from first hearing from them, which is a really unique uh, uh, thing. Uh, speed is a competitive advantage. Um, if we can do it faster than a week, we'll do it faster than a week. Um, but I think we're pretty much at the fastest possible uh, uh, ramp up time to start a brand new business. And is that, is that more prone to error or you feel like you have a quality quality selection process uh, that's just simply compressed to your competitive advantage in time? Uh, or are you trading off the uh, speed against uh, the risk of uh, more error? Well, there will be there will there will be error. Um, it's impossible to know for sure when it's that early, um, and that's why we believe that uh, you know past a certain amount of time, there's diminishing return. So if you have conviction in that time period, uh, we make we make the investment. There's a reason why it's called Pareto, um, and we will wind up spending eighty percent of our time on twenty yeah. percent of the investments. Um, what we try to do though is 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 invest in entrepreneurs multiple times because just like it took me you know 10 tries to get to shutterstock it may take us 10 tries with entrepreneurs and so uh we we, we hope that they they stick with us uh and we can get that full pareto uh data set that, that we need to to get to success okay let me let me hand back to michael because we have lots of uh, questions from our students yeah, yeah, a broad range here. But uh, uh, Ethan asks, John, um, how do you know who is going to be trustworthy and loyal to allow in your company? Yeah, it's uh, it's hard. Um, you need to uh, you, you definitely need to to kind of uh, make some leaps leaps of faith. Um, we do a lot of background kind of uh, back channel uh, references. Um, I mean, it's a difference between hiring an employee and, and kind of investing in a new entrepreneur. Hiring an employee, you can you can you can definitely do some network uh, reference checks. Hiring a new, um, starting with a new, with a new entrepreneur, that's why we like multiple uh, uh, kind of tries, uh, bites at the apple with with entrepreneurs. Uh, often we te we say, you know, your first try may not work, uh, but we get to know them really well through that first try. Um, and and. You know, if, if our program isn't right for them, it becomes clear. And if it is, we want to try a lot of startups with them. Any any secrets to your sauce? Are you playing golf with these people? Are you watching how they eat breakfast? Do you have any like tricks up your sleeve on, you know, how, how to really understand their character? You know, like like uh, what makes them tick? It's hard. I mean, you, you get to know people in, in lots of different ways. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking to them early on. Um, often I've looked at code they've written, I've tested products they've built. Um, I've asked them about, you know, how they feel about different ideas. The, the, the thing with early, early on uh, employees as well as entrepreneurs is the risk reward pro profile, right? And so like this person is going to be getting a pay cut to start a company. Like you, you but you have to be, you have to understand that, you know, you may you may go from making three hundred thousand dollars a year at a cushy job to making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars at a really really difficult kind of brand new entrepreneur startup being an entrepreneur in a startup, uh, but you're also getting a big chunk of a company that could be worth hundreds of millions of dollars or even billions in the future, right? So this is this is something that people have to be comfortable with. So um, it's kind of hard to fake that. Some people do. Some people don't know themselves if they're ready for that. Right. Right. But, it becomes very clear very fast. Yeah, teach deferred gratification. Okay, so so Brian, uh, entrepreneurship uh, major, asks during your your bootstrap days, how much time was spent day to day, and how much was was spent um, looking downfield? Right, you know, you got two legs all in. How much is is putting out fires? How much is is uh, you know making an acquisition or you know getting the next big customer or you know whatever whatever the the, the challenge was. Yeah, it was constantly, I switched a lot between different altitudes, like five feet and 50,000 feet. Sure. Um, sometimes multiple times throughout the day, right? So you're jumping into kind of, all right, this product feature, does the UX feel right? Like, is the copy on this, this page going to drive the most traffic? Is this the KPI that we're tracking? Like really, really granular details um, with your employees. And, you know, an, an hour later, you may be in your office by yourself thinking, 
okay, here's the competitive environment. Um, how do I move the chess pieces around in the right way in order to come out a year from now in the place I want to be? And that kind of altitude um, altern alternation um, has to happen fast. You have to be comfortable with it. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's a weird type of multitasking that y you need to get used to very fast. Like flying a helicopter, say? <laughs> kind of. Hopefully in the helicopter, you're not going between those altitudes. Yeah, yeah, or, or, or plummeting. Yeah, um, exactly. Jonathan asks, this is a, a good one. How would you say Shutterstock would evolve with NFTs and blockchain technology in the near future? Yeah, so we talk about that a lot. Um, and this is you know, getting out of the day to day. Uh, allowed me to kind of help think about this stuff. Um, on one side of, of my job, I see a lot of startups starting in the NFT and blockchain space. On the other side, I see a marketplace that could get disrupted by these technologies. So it's actually it's actually become super helpful for me to be involved in the super early stage and to help Shutterstock evolve to the next uh, phase. We talk about this all the time. There's going to be decentralized mechanisms out there um, and uh, the way that we uh, navigate that is going to be really important. Um, on the other side, um, you know, with NFTs, it's really interesting that one of the first commercial applications here is uh, some is is often photography and sometimes video. Two of our, you know, uh, two of the assets that make up most of the revenue at right. Shutterstock. So these are things we're thinking about constantly. Um, and uh, I, I talked to Stan, the management team. Uh, about this stuff all the time. There will be changes we've made. There aren't any, I mean, there are some NFT marketplaces like OpenSea that have uh, made big impacts. There are uh, some blockchain technologies and FinTech that are starting to you know, get, get some traction, um, but uh, we don't know yet what that target business model looks like. Uh, but, but I know we, you know we are thinking about it every single day and we will get there. Uh, here's a uh, great question from uh, from Raina. Um, she says, what's the ratio of uh, female male entrepreneurs that Pareto uh, will invest in? Well, we'd, we'd like to be as diverse as possible. Um, there, we, had, we do have several female entrepreneurs in our uh, uh, investment group. Um, and actually, I'd be open to meeting with as many as possible. We should uh, advertise the the link here the, at Pareto20.com, which is our pre-seed program. Um, and we, we would welcome female entrepreneurs of, of uh, with, with all types of ideas um, to apply. You'll be pleased to know that 40% of uh, um, the, the students here at Miami that are majoring or minoring in entrepreneurship um, were at 40% female. So not quite parity, but- That's great. Um, it's, it's, it's really exciting, exciting for us. Uh, and, and I think for the community. Um, Jessica okay. asks, um, what's the best piece of advice you have ever received? <laughs> yeah, that's hard. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, I don't, I don't know. I've gotten lots of advice, um, lots of great advice. Um, one of the things that, uh, one, one of the things that kind of I put together from a lot of different um, uh piece of advice that kind of became one of my mantras that I tell other entrepreneurs is that um, you should do every role in the business before um, handing it off. Um, and so like in the early days of Shutterstock, I was the first photographer, like we've talked about, I was the first customer service rep. Yeah. I was the first engineer, the first UX design, the UX design, the first uh, uh, like customer research kind of target. You know, I said, test your UX on me. Um, I did all the roles in the company. I was the first marketer. I wrote the first copy on the website. Um, these are things I still think about when, when, um, when I was, I still thought about when I was hiring people and I still think about when I'm starting other companies and advising other entrepreneurs. So it kind of came through a few different places, but that was, um, uh, probably the best grouping of advice that I've, that I've received over time. Alex wants to take us the other the other side of the spectrum. The the worst advice. Give us a war story, like something that was just you know thought was going to sink you, or you know, you, really made you sweat. Well, one of the we're in a we're in a strange fundraising environment right now. Um, one of the things I did not do was raise at really high valuations. Um, I, there were several times at Shutterstock I could have raised. 
Dilution myself um, it, and done several private rounds. Um, I chose to just do that one secondary and go towards being public. It's a different environment now, and so it depends really on the space you're going you're, you're going into. Um, but when I was bootstrapping, people kept telling me to go out and do rounds, and I resisted that because um, I didn't need the cash. The company was profitable, and so I, I think. There's there's insane pressure right now. We see uh, entrepreneurs getting uh, 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 constantly um, kind of courted by VCs to do do rounds. I, I think you should really just understand what you're going to use the money for um, before taking the dilution. Um, fantastic. Um, and 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 there is such a thing as smart money. Here's one from our provost. Um, Talk to us about how you, as an employer entrepreneur, assess a student's time at university, grades, activities. You know, do students put too much emphasis on, uh, you know, the, the coveted A? I think for when it comes to the skill set of entrepreneur, it's, it's, it's probably, th those are probably not the KPIs. Um, and I, I can tell you personally, I didn't get A's. <laughs> in school. So um, I, I probably um, uh, uh, wasn't wasn't that great of a student, actually. But what um, wh what you do need is this kind of grit, this this um, this persistence. Uh, you know, you're, you're constantly the second you start, there's going to be three competitors that started with you that are all well funded. Right. Being able to. Um, and this is something that we talk to our entrepreneurs all the time, being able to stay focused, calm, um, have your strategy, and just every single day execute. Um, that is really uh, the skill set that we look for. It's hard to evaluate for, um, uh, but 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 that's really what what you need. And it's that kind of obsessive. I, I look for that kind of obsessed look in people's eyes. You know, when they there's like a, there's there's a business idea that matches with their personality. And they were they were literally run through brick walls to get stuff done. Yeah, and you know, oftentimes here it's it's really difficult. Like, can we teach uh, grit or temerity? You know, some scholars are attempting to to study mindset growth and 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 things like grit. But at the end of the day, you know, it's it's a judgment call, right? And 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 there's trade offs. And um, so let's see, uh, Thomas. You know, in that vein wants to know more about, about that entrepreneurial mindset, right? So we can look at, we can't really do genetics without putting you into an fMRI, but like culturally, your parents were teachers. So, you know, was your rabbi uh, promoting you? Was it a coach? Like, where did you get your quest, your, your fire, your, your, you know, stick to itiveness? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was obsessed with with technology entrepreneurs and and reading about every little thing they did to understand um, how, how they got to where they they got. I mean, I knew I knew early on a lot of people did that um, you know technology was going to be um, uh, something that that changed everything in our lives uh, pretty dramatically. And with that kind of disruption and change comes opportunity to build. So my <clears throat> my question was always like, what are those next things? How do you how do you um, you know if 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 Bill Gates was able to drop out of college and build um, at the time a multi billion dollar today multi, you know trillion dollar company, how um, you know how many how many tries is it going to take? What do I have to learn? How do I make sure that um, I maximize uh, the time where I can take the most risk, which is usually during, you know, probably at the tail end of, of, of your, your university journey, kind of, you know, instead of entering your first job, start a company that th these are like the moments where um, you, you can take these kind of risks. I was obsessed with trying to figure that out. And I knew that um, I didn't want to get a job. I mean, I wound up getting jobs, yeah. <laughs> but uh, they were different. Um, and, and I knew I wanted to build so th th those are kind of my uh, uh, the things that drove me. Uh, truly fascinating. The, uh, the, the, the viewers can't get enough. Um, I don't know, Dean, if you have other things I can, uh, I think we're, we have a hard stop at six. Uh, unmute myself here. Um, so um, one, one of the things that um, 
uh, you've already referred to, John, and I think it uh, reflected in the Pareto concept is uh, mentoring. And I, I'm wondering whether or not you uh, had any um, serious mentors uh, early on, uh, other than family members. Mm -hmm. uh, and what makes a good mentor? Because I think part of what you're doing and giving back in a way through Pareto is, is that. Yeah, throughout the years at different phases, I would ask different people. Um, I looked for people that have been through things before, right? So before I before we went public, I reached out to 20 um, uh, public company CEOs and asked them if I can ask them questions. Most of them ignored me. A couple of them said yes, and I, I wound up talking to them. Um, <clears throat> it's it was it was things like that. I was always kind of curious. I was always seeking out. I was always asking questions. Um, and I think that's that's kind of part of uh, being an entrepreneur. Also, is 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 going out there and not being you know forcing yourself to get out there and and and, and ask people those questions. Um, and those are, you know, that's the way I learned. I learned by throwing myself in the deep end, um, after asking, you know, as many people, as many questions as I could possibly, I get early on, it wasn't possible. I didn't, ju I just did not have the network. So early on, I basically was again in my dorm room, you know, visual studio and some Perl code and a server that was in the corner, kind of heating up the room, um, and blowing out the circuit, uh, in the hallway, uh, every week. So uh, I didn't really have it, you know, but over time you build that, um, you get more access and, and you start asking more questions. And, um, I'm actually, I was actually surprised at how many people would give me their time. Um, you have to try a lot. Uh, a lot of people will not, but they will. Can yeah, you, rem can you remember a couple of those CEOs? I'm, I'm curious, uh, who were the ones who, uh, answered your call? The entrepreneurs, I bet. Yeah, yeah, they were the entrepreneurial ones. Um, I don't want to throw out their names right here, but they were they were early technology company CEOs that um, you know had had been through certain things that uh, and and you know they got on the phone with me for 30, 40 minutes and let me ask questions and that was pretty much all I needed. Um, <clears throat> and so so yeah, so a lot of our entrepreneurs do the same, um, and I'm happy to help them. What, what percentage of your time each week do you think you spend uh, coaching or advising other people? It's it's hard to measure because they come through text, WhatsApp, email, sometimes a phone call, um, but it's lots of little little interactions. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I can tell they, you know, I mean, sometimes I don't have the answers. You know, the world's different today than it was when, when I started companies. And you know, sometimes I just don't know. I can just kind of offer my opinion. Um, ultimately, the entrepreneur is, 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 you know, responsible for their business. And, um, and that's how it is. Um, but, yeah, I mean, everything from uh, kind of the, the early technology decisions, early hires, fundraising, um we, we we deal with so um you had to pretty much create your own ecosystem the word ecosystem didn't really exist when you were starting out so we talk about the entrepreneurship ecosystem uh in miami for example to what extent do you think uh, that actually adds value and increases the probability of uh, individuals succeeding? And if so, how? Yeah, the ecosystem is important. We're in this kind of hybrid work environment these days. Uh, so, you know, people are going to be everywhere. Um, the thing I love about Miami is that it feels like New York in the early 2000s, um, except it's moving a lot faster. And that kind of... Um, uh, fast paced growth, uh, where it's like every week you hear about a new company starting a new company, moving a new funding round. Um, uh, the, these are the things that, 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 that build insane momentum. Uh, you know, when, when Miami has its first multi-billion dollar IPO or exit, you know, and those people go off and start other companies, these are going to be, uh, pretty amazing events for, for that city. I think through COVID, um, I think 
the, the fact that we now have multiple places people can start businesses and hybrid environments that can kind of help lots of different cities around the world grow, I think is a good thing and will help us uh, build more faster. Do you think we have enough engineers? There's never enough engineers. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there, you know, it's, it's always hard. It's just about every single business we start, um, and even Shutterstock finding engineers is still on the top of the problem list. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon. Um, but the good news is we, you know, we have more and more resources and tools for people to learn how to become, uh, great, uh, engineers and programmers. Uh, the tool sets are getting, um, you know, there's lots of these low code, no code kind of tool sets like Figma um, and, and other uh, 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 tools that help people, you know, code faster and, um, and and get things to market quicker, get MVPs out there. Um, you know, things like React, for instance, are, are, are pretty amazing creations. Um, and I think these are, I think it's going to create more entre more engineers faster. Uh, for us. Uh, what, what's the difference between an executive chairman and the CEO? Uh, it's it's different in, in every uh, every executive chairman I've met has a different role. Um, so it's a pretty pretty amorphous thing. Uh, but uh, the way that uh, we've defined it um, is it's it's more of a strategic uh, capital allocation uh, M a, uh, big product road roadmap kind of multi-year planning uh, type of role, uh, which, uh, which which works for us. Okay, and um, are, are you a good chairman? Uh, the CEO is not being uh, uh, second guessed all the time. <laughs> I I try not. We have a great relationship. Uh, maybe he'll say he'll say say maybe he'll have a different answer, but. Um, but look, I, I knew that when I switched from executive from CEO to executive chairman, I was not going to be involved in, in the day to day details. I knew there would be uh, decisions he would make that um, maybe I wouldn't make. But, um, you know, you can look at our stock price. And since I left, it's 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 doing pretty well. So uh, I have no desire to micromanage him. So I think this uh, has been an unusual conversation because in 55 minutes, I believe the word leadership has not been mentioned once. So what's the difference between leadership and entrepreneurship? I mean, I, I don't think you can be a good entrepreneur without being a good leader. So they're, they're kind of, they're, they're kind of uh, uh, complementary. Um, I think, uh, y yeah, I mean, I, being an entrepreneur is hard. Uh, it takes it takes bringing you know a group of people to the place you, you want to bring them to, and often um, it's not it, it's it may be clear in your head, but it's not in theirs. Um, and so um, you know drawing that storyline and and bringing them along, uh, it, it's it's not easy, but it's required. Um, is can you talk about the impact of COVID on photography? Did people take a lot more photographs and put a lot more material up on your website during COVID? Or were they, yeah, not, our, or were they not getting out and socializing and therefore they didn't have anything to photograph except the cat? <laughs> our, uh, our content has been, um, our library has been growing pretty, pretty significantly. Uh, and I think, um, you know, COVID has helped the, uh, gig economy in, in a way um, and a lot of our content creators are are independents uh, that do um, you know they may do some work on the side and as they're doing that work they may generate content that they sell on Shutterstock and so it um, it's uh, I, I think it, it the way it's changed people the way people work um, I think has benefited Shutterstock what what makes a great contributor on Shutterstock? What uh, what are the keys to success as a contributor? Yeah, the best contributors are the ones that are are thinking ahead as to what content's going to be needed in that next phase. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when COVID surprised all of us that you know uh, uh, that month, um, you know, it was the people who got that imagery to illustrate 
uh, the issue up the fastest that uh, got the most downloads and ultimately were the most successful on the platform. So ba basically it's uh, being on top of the news cycle rather than uh, photographing a beautiful dog or cat. Yeah, yeah, it's often it's often um, being timely with 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 kind of trends in the world, um, creating content that engages uh, our customers. Mm -hmm. uh, by engagement, it could be anything from you know seeing more advertisements on a website to selling a product in an e-commerce way. Um, all of our customers are businesses, and so um, if they're able to help businesses, they're successful. Uh, Michael, have you got a final question or two? Yeah, I, th I think, uh, you know, to wrap everything up, John, it's been phenomenal um, at so many levels. Um, but what would you see as, 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 as a win for the entire Miami community where university and industry bridge? How can we do a better job of, of uh, uh, working together, uniting, and, and really making this, this the hemispheric hub, which our, you know, our leadership here has has proclaimed, you know, or, you know, you could have moved to Buffalo, you could have moved to Iowa and you're here in Miami, you know, what, what, what could you see us doing for you and, and vice versa? Yeah. I think making it clear that, um, well, I, I mean, taking a step back, like, uh, Miami has been, a um, for, for a while, I think a net exporter of talent, right. Um, yeah. to the Facebooks and Silicon Valley and Google's and huge companies. Um, uh, on the West Coast, maybe something in New York. I think, can, you know, making sure students know that we want to build this ecosystem and there's a support network there that's building at the same time. Um, I think, you know, companies get built, success gets created, people make money, and then people go off from those companies and create new companies. It's that kind of network effect that we need to create in Miami uh, and South Florida and just letting people know that that is an option down there. Um, and it's, it's, you can be more successful than you've ever been. Um, and every day keeps getting better is, is important. Terrific. Uh, it's a great uh, line on which to end. Uh, John, thank you very much for uh, joining us and uh, for you know, all you're contributing to uh, the South Florida economy. And appreciate uh, your time. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, everybody, on the uh, webinar. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Michael. And uh, good night from Miami.